to Commitment to Truth, the outreach ministry of Commitment Community Church, a place for all nations. To learn more about Commitment, please visit our website, www.commitmentchurch.org. Like us on Facebook and download our mobile app. Now, let's enjoy today's message. So, uh, God has appointed and entrusted us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, so we speak uh, not as men pleasers, but ultimately uh, God examines our hearts. Um, But that is a big deal. That's a big challenge that we all have because the human nature is to is to go and perform so that we will please man. Um, We are historically men pleasers, right? I mean, you look at any child, they want to please mom and dad, right? If they draw a picture, they, no matter how, how horrific that picture looks, right? They'll, they'll bring it and say, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, look, 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 look. And of course, mom and dad says, okay, you, honey, that's beautiful. And who is that? <laughs> right? And, and it's stick figures and beyond. And, but yet, there's something in us inherently that we are just men pleasers. We, we, we are set up in life that we want to please our boss, right? Be it good motives or bad motives. We want to maybe please our boss to get a promotion, right? We want to please our professors in college and all these different things. And it's performance-based, performance-based to ultimately please men. But yet, uh, when we go in the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it has nothing to do with a performance. and has nothing to do with pleasing man. But ultimately, it's about pleasing God Almighty. God Almighty. And, it, and if we don't get that right, what it will do is taint the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, I'll begin to be, uh, preach a different message to you because I want you to like me. Right. I want you to affirm me. I want you to get along with me. I want you to uh, not uh, disassociate yourself with me. And, and, and that's the battle that guys like myself who stand here before you are, are you in your everyday life is that am I going to say that what I know it is right, what I know that only saves a person, can redeem a person, change a marriage, change a family generationally, or what I tickle ears, or will I only say things to maybe affirm myself and make myself feel better and warm and fuzzy relationally with someone, or will I understand that it's never about pleasing man, but it's ultimately about pleasing God, even if it ends up offending man. Now, I've learned over the years that uh, I defer to please God, and it may temporarily offend man. You follow me? temporarily offend man, either that person comes around and God redeems the relationship that I have with them, or that person comes around one day that every knee bows and every tongue confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord of all. So at the end of the day, that, that person is going to come to the realization that Jesus is the only way if you like it or not. All right. But our responsibility is to make sure we're delivering the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in all condition, in, in every situation, no matter what the condition may be. So that being said, we're going to answer two questions. It is this, what are we going with as we go? And uh, why only the gospel? What are we going with? Just to rehash that and, and redefine that or reaffirm that. But then secondly, why only the gospel? Why only the gospel? So if you can open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 uh, through 2, we'll begin with. What are we going with? It says, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. In other words, I didn't come to you um, with video clips that can get a lot of hits on Facebook and Twitter, all right, Instagram, but I came to you with uh, a speech that was not maybe superior, a superior. Okay, I didn't come to you with my own personal wisdom, but I came, what, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. 
For I determined, listen to what it says, to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Can you imagine how simple ministry will be? Can you imagine how simple conversations will be? It's like, hey, let's cut through the chase. It's just about Jesus and him crucified in a story. <laughs> we wish it was that easy, but, but that is the simplicity of the gospel. Really, church, the, the, the gospel is not that complex. It's so simple, it's deep. It's really not complex at all. Guys like myself and, and those who, who want to impress people make it super complex, but it's really, really, really simple, but yet it is so powerful. So here we find that what are we going with? We're going with nothing else, nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In summary, the gospel. That's what we go with. There's nothing else that we should go with. There's no other tools. There's no tricks of the trade. There's no other format that can save and deliver and change and transform a person's life. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that will rescue a marriage Listen, uh, uh, allow someone to be delivered with drugs or whatever it may be. Listen, just to give you peace of mind, there's no other option, no other option but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, and he just affirms this even more. He says, we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts, verse 5, for we never came, never, underscore never, we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. There's no other motive. God is our witness, nor did we seek, listen to what it says, glory from men. Not about prestige, not about honor, not about my personal gain, but it's simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this, and he describes the gospel. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. In other words, he received the message and he's delivering it to you in first place, in first importance, right? I received it as a pastor. Now it's my responsibility to do what? Give it to you as first importance. First importance. Because the gospel is, the, is what everything is tethered to. You want peace, it's the gospel. You want joy, it's the gospel. You want love, it's the gospel. It's the gospel, it's the gospel, it's first importance. It says that Christ died for our sins according to what? Man's words? No, the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to what? The scriptures. That's what we preach, that Jesus Christ came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. So if, in fact, you want to carry this message, this is the message you should know. You need to mark this, earmark this, dog, dog, dog ear this page, and put tabs and colors all around this particular passage of Scripture. If someone says, what is the gospel? Here's your answer. What do you go with? Here's your answer. If you need to be reminded about what you're going with, here's your answer. The gospel is what we stand upon. The gospel, listen, church, it is the first, it's of first importance, which really it says there's nothing else that is important as the gospel. Nobody wants to come in second place, third place, fourth place. Everybody wants to be first place. And the scriptures are saying to you and I that the gospel is what? First, period. But why only the gospel? Why only the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you continue in verses 3 through 5, it says this. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of what? The spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith 
would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on what? The power of God. That your faith would not rest upon your pastor. That your faith will not rest upon your mom or dad. Your faith will not rest upon those that are influencers in your life, but ultimately on what? The power of God. And so many followers of Jesus Christ, listen, do not see the power of God in their lives. You know why? It's because we do not live gospel-centered lives, period. We don't see the power of God in our families. We, listen, we don't even see the power of God in our finances. You know why? It's because we don't live gospel-centered lives. Well, let me work harder. Not saying one shouldn't work hard, because the scripture is clear about that, that a man who doesn't work for his family is worse than, worse, and provides for them is worse than an infidel. So he says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands. Poverty will come upon you like a thief in the night. So God is about working. But if your working is only about working and making money and building your 401k and your retirement, and it's all about you, 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 and the gospel is not attached to it, you will work yourself to early grave, period. Why do you work? Is it to advance the gospel? Why do you work? Is it because you want to give uh, to, towards the gospel so others can know what you know that has tra changed and transformed your life? Or is it merely just to hoard and hoard and get more and more and more so you can have, in your mind, peace? You gain the whole world, lose your soul. Well, I'm going to work on my marriage. I'm going to work on my marriage. I'm going to work on my marriage. Then you lose it. He walks out on you still. She still don't give you the cookie. You do everything she says, everything she says, everything she says, and it's never enough. It's never enough. But if it's the gospel, if it's gospel-centered, if it's about the gospel, if, it, if it's propelling from the gospel, taking you back to the gospel, some way, somehow, God supernaturally, powerfully begins to do things that you can never think or imagine in that context in which you need them to. The gospel ultimately gives you proof, verse 3 and 4. The gospel gives you proof of the Holy Spirit. So many times we say, well, I don't see God moving. I don't, where, where is the Holy Spirit? I hear people talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is tethered to the gospel. You really think the comforter, the helper, in which Jesus Christ died, conquered the grave for, is merely just so I can accomplish good deeds? No, 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 no. It's about the gospel. In demonstration, this word demonstration means this, to prove, to manifest, to become proof the Holy Spirit is alive and well on the inside of his, his people. Wouldn't that be amazing? There are churches full of people that the Holy Spirit was manifesting himself through. Can you imagine the impact? Verse 3 says, I was there with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Think about that. Paul was there in fear and trembling much, not just some, but yet somehow in that fear and that trembling, the Holy Spirit was manifested. I humbly believe it's because it wasn't about Paul. Paul was scared. He was shaking in his boots. But yet some way, somehow, the Holy Spirit got him through it. 
And then no one is looking at Paul and saying, wow, he, he's so eloquent. He's so eloquent. Wow, look at Paul. Look at Paul. But it was saying, no, 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 look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus because of the power of the Holy Spirit working through Paul. You also see in verse 4, is that the gospel gives proof of God's power in you. So, so again, we, we have this, this evidence of the Holy Spirit, but then also the evidence of the power of God. It says, and of the power. This word power means imparted from God both physically or morally. Physically or morally. You, you hear the term, this is a godless society. You know why? It's because physically and morally, right, People are living deprived, physically, morally. So what you have here is that when it's attached to the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen, the gospel is going to make sure that we're living physically and moral good lives. It's going to differentiate the way you deal with things on the job versus how other people deal with things on the job. And you know what people are going to somehow deduce? There's something different about you. You know why? It's because there's the manifestation of the power of God in your life. You're choosing to do things that are right as opposed to everybody else. The way you raise your children, right, is going to differentiate you versus everyone else in a godless society. The way you do business transactions is going to differentiate you as opposed to everyone else. And it's going to manifest what? The power of God in your life. That's what the gospel does. The gospel says do what's right in a business deal. A God, the gospel of Jesus Christ says be fair and equitable between both parties. Make sure the scales are even, weighted even, as the scriptures talks about. One just doesn't do that under their own volition because, you know, it was selfish by nature. But the gospel keeps us accountable to weigh the scales properly. Then you look at verse 5, the power of the gospel points to God and away from man. I, I, I'm a firm believer that as a pastor in ministry for, for years and even have an opportunity to lead in corporate America and all that stuff and influence people is that if it's about the gospel, yeah, you may get partial credit or people will see you doing something, but yet they will always see someone behind you. If it's about the gospel, if it's self-promotion, if it's self-edification, self-gratification. It's about me and, and building my career, right? Building my resume. And, and it's about me, 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 me. There's no gospel in that. But if it's about him, 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 they'll look through you to see him or they'll look beyond you to see him. And that's the way, the way it should always be. The gospel will always point people to God rather than man or shift people from man onto God. Remember what Paul says, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. In other words, he's communicating that, you know what? At the end of the day, you may be following me and looking to me, but always understand that I'm always following and looking to someone myself. In other words, there's someone who's always bigger and better and better than me. And you have the option to bypass me and follow them yourself. Follow him yourself. Why only the gospel? It's proof of the Holy Spirit, proof of God's power in you, and also transferred, uh, I guess, uh, you could say glory and honor from man to God, man to God. That's what the gospel does. Whenever you see an environment that that it's about the man, 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 it's unhealthy. It should always be about the gospel. But let's shift to Romans chapter 15 verses, Romans chapter 1 verses 15 through uh, 17, and we can find our last two points as it relates to why only the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why only the gospel of Jesus Christ? Romans chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. 
it says this. It says, so for my part, this is Paul talking again, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Pretty much is saying to everybody, right? Jew, of course, that's, he came to the Jews first, but by God's grace, the Greeks is symbolic of everyone else outside of uh, Jewish culture and race. It says, for it, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as, is, as it is written, but the righteous man shall what? Live by faith. Here's our final two points. The first you find in verse 15 and 16 is this. The gospel is the only thing that leads to salvation. Do you realize, even though we're going to talk about our, our, one of our ministries that's kind of our, our way of infiltrating the community, we're going to talk about that at the end of the message. We can do a lot of good deeds for the community, but it won't save anybody. We can feed, clothe, shall give shelter. We can do it all. But guess what? We'll not save anybody. Good deeds are good. That's what they are. But they're not powerful enough to lead to salvation. Will it tenderize a person's heart? Absolutely. Will it gather people in to hear the gospel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would it create pathways to the gospel? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it is still not the gospel, period. The gospel is the only thing that ever is going to be able to save anyone. To transform a person's life, it's only the gospel. It leads to salvation. The word lead means this, an intention a purpose, an aim, an end for purpose of. So think about that. It is, the, it is what leads to salvation. It is ultimately what is leading to the intention and the purpose and the aim, and that is the gospel, is that is salvation. That is the ultimate aim. The aim is Come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior as I have. Word salvation means it's the deliverance from sin and its spiritual consequences. It leads, from, it leads to a deliverance of sin and the spiritual consequences. In other words, sin will ultimately send you to hell. You will, you will die eternally. So the gospel leads to salvation that will ultimately allow people to be redeemed from the grips of uh, spiritual death. But then it also is an attachment to the body of Christ. So you have this deliverance of sin, but salvation also does what? Attaches you to the body of Christ. You deliver, but then you attach. But then here's the beautiful thing that that leads to as well. And then you have this eternal, blessed life that comes along with it because you're now in the kingdom of God. You, you see the cycle? So salvation is not merely, okay, I'm dying, I'll go to heaven. It's way bigger than that. And for years, the church has gotten that wrong. And I believe it has stagnated the gospel of Jesus Christ because people uh, people are saying, okay, yeah, I die, go to uh, be with Jesus, but what about today? I don't like these crumb snatchers anymore. They've grown up and they become adults, and I don't like them right now. <laughs> and they're going to send me to an early grave. You follow me? What, what, what does the gospel have to do with that? What does the gospel have to do with the person that I'm sleeping next to and, and I'm, I'm realizing, wow, you know, I don't like them anymore. What does the gospel have to do with, yeah, that person I'm sleep, sleep, sleeping with, that they're not my husband or my wife. What's the gospel have to do with sexual addictions and other kind of addictions? What's the gospel have to do with that? 
That's the real world. It's like, okay, you know, I got a, I have a few more years maybe left, and how, what am I going to do in the meantime? The gospel is also for today. It rescues you from sin. It rescues you from sin. It rescues you from sin. And then it immediately plants you within a group of people that maybe, yeah, you don't get along with all the time. But guess what? At the end of the day, it's your body. Do you like your nose? Maybe you do. Do you like your eyes? Maybe you don't. Do you like the way your ears are shaped? Do you like the way your body's shaped? You can't get a new one. You could try to alter it, but you're going to you're gonna have the same one. You learn to get along with your body. The same is true in the body of Christ. You come to know Jesus Christ. He rescues you from sin and death. He plants you in the body of Christ. You, you wake up in the, you know, out of the ether and you realize, oh, okay, we don't all like each other. Well, what's new? Do you get along with all of your siblings? Do you get along with all your cousins and aunts and uncles? No. How then do we think we're going to just all get along together in the body of Christ? Uh, but the only way is that be of the same mind, intent on one purpose. And you know what that same mind is, singleness of mind? You know what that intent on one, pur one purpose is? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That I'm not going to throw this relationship away that's in now my new family because we're not seeing eye to eye. And the only thing that can hold that together is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can hold together and cause you to have such a huge family in the body of Christ is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you accumulate family members over a lifetime. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You come to know Christ, you have this group of family members. You, you know, you grow in Christ, you grow another group. And you, you know, and you just grow and you just grow. It doesn't, okay, well, I don't like you, subtract. Well, we had a falling out, subtract. Well, I don't like how you dress, subtract. I don't like your tattoos, subtract. Well, I don't like what race you are, subtract. I don't like what culture you are, subtract. I don't like how you sing, subtract. You're too loud in worship, subtract. You're too quiet in worship, subtract. And we just subtract, 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 subtract. Versus the gospel adds, 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 adds to the body of Christ. It's the gospel. Which then comes with the tons of benefits of the kingdom. And my realization is this over my lifetime. Is because we subtract so many relationships, we many times lose out on the kingdom benefits of even relationships that we subtracted versus working through it and getting over ourselves and dealing with issues and growing the family of God in relationships, then the kingdom becomes bigger than just your little address. Let me close with this. If we go with something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 reminds us. And we, we kind of alluded to this earlier. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the story continues outside of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians uh, 15 verses 14 through 19. It says... And if Christ has not been raised, remember we talked about the gospel is what? Death, burial, resurrection. So if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testify against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ have been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, 
your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, if you had loved ones who have gone before you and died, they're just floating out there in an abyss somewhere. And then lastly, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are all men most to be pity. Let me summarize this. Everything is futile. Our witness is, our witness is false. We are liars. We have worthless faith. We'll never see our family and friends again. Can you imagine a life like that? And we're foolish. This word pity, pitied, means we're miserable. And, and, can I, and can I just end with this final thought? There are miserable Christians. And maybe you walked in here miserable. But hopefully you won't leave miserable after this. If you do not believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you will be miserable. If you do not live as though you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you will be miserable. If you believe that there's some other option than the finished work of Jesus Christ, if you believe that, okay, if he loves me now, then I will be okay. If she loves me now, then I will be okay. If I get married, then I will be okay. Once I have my first child, then I will be okay. If my child comes to their senses, then I will be okay. If I make more money, then I will be okay. You will be a follower of Jesus Christ. Christ who is absolutely miserable but if you choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ that hangs his or her hat on the finished work of Jesus Christ alone alone you'll always be a man or woman of God who walks in peace joy confidence the power of the Holy Spirit, you see fruit in your life like never before, both physically and spiritually. And I believe that is why we have so many churches and people say they're Christians who are fruitless. Because there's another option than the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to instantaneously move the misery in your life, the ups and downs, the highs and lows, good day, bad day. If you want to have good days all the time, focus on the gospel. And whenever you feel like yourself going south and feeling a little disrupted and confused and irritated, you know that you have lost sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need more fasting and praying and, okay, let me memorize Bible verses. All that's good. That's all that's good. But if you don't hang your head on the gospel, what good is studying Bible verses? Because you don't even believe the, the true essence of it all, the whole context of the book. You grab one piece out and try to memorize it to get you through, but you don't believe in the full context of the book. And it's about Christ and him crucify, and him coming to redeem the world. From the beginning to the end, Satan's head will be crushed. From the beginning to the end, it's been about Jesus. It's about the gospel. It's like, wait a minute, but that is so simple. Man, God, believe it or not, he ain't that difficult to understand. We make it complex. Stop making it so complex. It's just when you see yourself derailing, getting off track, frustrated, ask yourself the question, have I lost sight of the finished work of Jesus Christ? And one way that we stay focused on it 
is always be going. Always be going. Always be going. Always be going. Are you walking past people and not telling them the goodness of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ? Are you sitting in hair salons, barber chairs? Are you, are you working side by side with people in cubicles and you're not telling them about the love and the finished work of Jesus Christ? Are you serving customers and you're not telling them about, creatively telling them about the love of Jesus Christ? Is your life not matching up with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which ultimately gives you the platform to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ? If it's not, there's this reciprocal effect. There's this snowball effect that occurs. You lose track. You get distracted. When was the last time you have gone into the world to tell somebody about the finished work of Jesus Christ? When was the last time you'd gone to work, gone to the Wawa, gone to Starbucks, gone to Dunkin' Donuts with the intentions, you know what, God, give me an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. If you haven't, chances are, you're not that happy. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just supernaturally remove the misery when we choose to obey you. When we choose to go into all the world with the gospel. God, we will see men, women, children of all nations, tribes, and tongues come to know you. And man, I've never, I've personally, God, I've never seen an opportunity of me sharing my faith or leading someone to Christ that it did not bring me joy. God, let not your people lose sight of this or miss out on these opportunities, but keep it intentionally in the forefront of our mind to go with the gospel. Give them opportunities this week to share their faith, to see someone come to know Christ so misery can be gone completely because the gospel is the center of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Commitment to Truth, the outreach ministry of Commitment Community Church. If you would like to learn more about Jesus Christ, please visit our website, www.commitmentchurch.org forward slash start. This website will walk you through having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Please let us know if you made a decision to follow Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or if you would like to support God's word through this ministry, please visit our website at www.commitmentchurch.org. Lastly, if you or your family are in the South Jersey or Philly metro area, please visit us at Commitment Community Church.